Rebecca Lyons is on the show, everyone. First time ever, Rebecca. I it know. Way too long. How did this not happen sooner? Because you've written like know. a bazillion books and you are totally in our stream of consciousness about mental health and the body. So welcome to the Revelation Wellness Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I've been a, a long time fan and an admirer of your work. And then we've talked online, but finally got to be in real life together, yeah. which was my great joy. And so now I just know we need to be doing this a lot more frequently. A lot more <laughs> frequently. And if you're on YouTube watching this, she is sporting the Love Pace Race hat. Yo, it's yeah, happening. So she is going to be, are you going to, what distance are you thinking of in terms of 5k, 10k, half or full? You don't have to be fully committed, but what, what's your heart gravitating towards for the love pace race? Yeah. I mean, I, if I've kind of had a rhythm of doing 10,000 steps a day, which is always around like 4.2 miles, mm -hmm. so I think I could probably bump up to a 10k. Um, yeah, girl. Um, and then just depending, you know, again, if you plan like a whole thing around it, I'm still kind of recovering, as you know, from foot, foot surgery in January, mm -hmm. but each month I get a little stronger and mm -hmm. can go a little further. So I, I think the jury's still out where it'll land, but at least I could say a 10 K I think. It's going to be fun. I'm going to, we'll start there. And then I'm going to yeah. be coaching a few. Oh, I know you will. How it, I know. <laughs> I should have I said, I should have said 1k. I, <laughs> I would have applauded you and kept pushing you along. <laughs> you and I have a couple friends in common. I'm let's text and I'm like going, okay, how we doing? Are we good? No injuries? Like we're getting ready. I want them yes. to make it across the finish line. Oh, yes. uh, so girl, you have been out there talking about mental health. Um, you recently wrote a book on resiliency. What is it titled? Building a resilient life. Yeah. And you're kind of your whole, what was your first, first book? Was it, you are free. My first book was called free fall to fly. And that was oh, really yeah. chronicling that crash and burn that catalyzed this whole entire mental health journey. So it was more memoir and it just talked about the rescue of God after about a year and a half of panic disorder, yeah. um, that was acute and started really quickly in my late thirties. So Yeah. And then as a result of that, I think that started me with, you know, practicing these regulating rhythms, knowing movement and connection mm -hmm. and creativity mm -hmm. and, um, silence and all these things were very important for our mm -hmm. health. And, mm -hmm. um, just over time, just kept growing in that field and understanding of what the body mm -hmm. needs, what the mind needs, what, what our heart needs and totally. how to normalize prevention care. I mean, that's my heart is to normalize prevention care instead of overdiagnose everything that ails us. Um, Oof. because all, everything, if we overdiagnose everything that is just normal adversity, then we'll actually shrink back to the life that we were created to live. And, and I think we're actually stronger than we think. And we need to step towards those things, which is this resilient message, how adversity awakens strength and hope and meaning and mm -hmm. our hearts. Um, mm -hmm. but sometimes because safety, you can't have permanent safety. You weren't made for that. You were actually made to overcome. Right. And so that's why I think we need a little tough love in the mental mm -hmm. health space. <laughs> mm -hmm. So was this a message that you learned the hard way or did you have some teachers along the way? Did it come because of the crisis of the breakdowns or the panic attacks? Like how did this become a revelation to you? of this integrated normalizing prevention care story? Yeah, honestly, I think it was truly God and the Holy Spirit because yes, I would, when I first had my very first panic attack in 2010, I did not have language for it. I thought like everyone, like I'm having a heart attack or I have mm. some of, you know, something's wrong with my heart because the acute rate of the heart with that adrenaline was more like 160 to 180 with no mm -hmm. logical reason why. And mine was triggered by claustrophobia, which, you know, okay. looking back now on my journey, I understand a little bit more why that was the case. But at the time my, I had no support and a therapist finally said, I think your body can no longer contain the emotional unrest that you've been managing. And that was kind of helpful, but then what? Um, thankfully <laughs> I lived in New York city at the time 
which while it was a place of extreme claustrophobia everywhere you went, like 8 million people in the span of 11 miles and planes, trains, elevators, subways, and crowds. Also, what was helpful though, is that I had to walk everywhere and it was a pedestrian lifestyle. So I'm like having to combat tight wow. spaces, but I'm also regulating my brain through movement. And wow. it was the very first winter while I was still walking through some forms of panic attacks that I didn't have depression. I didn't have seasonal depression that winter because even in 11 degree temps, I forced myself to walk to the gym and, I, and the snow would always kind of clean the air. And I was like, why am I having the first successful, you know, winter of not feeling sad? I was, I didn't like feeling in tight spaces, but I didn't have depression. And that was kind of surprising to me because I had had seasonal depression in Georgia for years. I would just go from my kitchen to the garage, to the car, and I didn't move outside. I didn't clear my lungs. I didn't clear my head. And so pedestrian culture uh, awakened me as a writer because every time I would walk, I would think of new thoughts and ideas would emerge and I'd stop and get it down on my notes app. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when my writing career began as well because the brain needs movement. The brain needs novelty to create. And so I encountered that every day, every minute of every day in New York. So while it was a place of trauma, it was also a setting of exponential heal healing because I had to combat and get in an elevator all the time. So cognitive behavioral therapy would say, you don't run from fear, you confront it, you turn towards it because if you run from fear, it grows. And so we moved downtown halfway in and I lived in a, a high rise and I had to get on an elevator every single day after kind of the reprieve from panic, knowing like this, I had to just exercise faith. And so Mm. I started to learn, I was like, and I never had gone on medication in that season, partly because I'm a little bit of a control freak and I was afraid of all the side effects. <laughs> and I had watched my dad be on medication for years for chronic depression and never mm. really heal. He actually mm. got worse as he aged. And I thought, well, let's at least try to see how we can do this through movement, through people, through connection, through crying out to God, through all the things. Um, and it, we just took one day at a time and that slowly unfolded. And so I went out of the city to write that first book, came back in the city, got on the subway, had a, almost in a panic attack again. And that was the night I wrote in my journal. I want, I want to develop rhythms of renewal. Yeah. And, and I started just, and I, I was just talking to Justin early about this, this week, cause he was at our um, marriage and parenting retreat, uh, this weekend, Justin and who? Justin Whitmill, Early, who wrote Habits of the Household, yeah. and he had the same story, like a crazy breakdown, um, and how he knew he needed to put regulating rhythms in his life, and his look different habits, but rhythms, same thing, and how we both, you kind of come to this crisis moment where it is not optional to do what it means to be human, um, to just make that a regular practice in your life. And when you do, you realize that those healing rhythms heal. I mean, they do the work mm -hmm. of healing. They're not profound. They're just what the way society has always operated, you know, agrarian lifestyle, um, yeah. circadian rhythm boundaries of circadian rhythm, a pedestrian yeah. lifestyle, clean food from the ground. That's how centuries, you know, people have gotten through trauma, <laughs> tethered to clan or tribe, like community builders. So I just think we're all have struggling because we've gotten outside the bounds of what the container of what humanity has always looked like and was intended to be. So, gosh, that's so true. I was listening to a podcast uh, over the weekend. Do you do you listen to the Huberman podcast ever, Doctor Huberman? I, I sometimes do, not as much as I'd like. Well, he's yeah, it's a neuroscientist. Well, yeah, like a neuroscientist out of. Yeah. Um, Harvard, Stanford University. And he had a doctor on named Dr. Casey Meads. She was talking about metabolic health. Like basically everything is done, comes down to our cells. Like our mm -hmm. cells are not even as healthy as they once were because of our environment, because mm -hmm. of whether it's our soils, the food, the air, mm -hmm. the toxins, like we're just not even breathing the same air that we once upon a time breathed. So metabolically we're, we're, not operating well. But one of the key things she talks about is going outside. So as you mentioned, 
like leaving your house in New York city. I, I love New York city. Don't do you, do you love it still? Or were you I like, still love it. I still love it. I it. still love it. Yes, I do love it. And I just got there. My husband and I, we go a few times a year and it, I feel alive there as much as you do feel condensed, sure. but I think it is the rhythm of you got to leave your house. You got to get into the stairs. You got to, you get embodied. You're surrounded you by are. bodies. The There's embodiment. embodiment all the time, carrying your groceries, wheeling yeah. them down the street. How am I going to get my yes. groceries to the house? So, and you can't that. not bump into people. There no. is no victory of, of, you know, personal space. Yeah. <laughs> so and so even that the human condition is confronted there, whether or not you like it. And I think that's good for us. And Cause the, yeah. Cause you think about affluent separates, you know, everyone gets their mm -hmm. private, the witcher you are, the yeah. more secluded you can become, yeah. which is actually yeah. the sicker you become. Yeah. But in New York, it doesn't matter what money you make. You are still just thrust <laughs> it's into so true. an elevator with 12 other humans. You have no idea who they are. And I yeah. just think that's actually very kingdom. Like, um, yeah, everything has to blend and merge, um, ethnically, socioeconomically, um, you know, generationally, I think, I think that's just yeah. what the kingdom looks like. So I agree. I agree. The kingdom is a city. Like it is a city, like a city that comes down from, like we know new heaven, new earth, it comes down like a city. It doesn't come down like a farm. Farms are great. Everyone yeah. love the yeah. farm. I mean, God's, God's a fan of farming. Don't get me yes. wrong. <laughs> But, the city, but there's the a beautiful richness on both for different reasons. Yeah. 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 So Casey Meads was saying it is now recorded that we live indoors 93, 93% of our time of our life, of our week, of our day, like 93%. We can just be indoors. We don't even go out into natural sunlight, into mm. natural fresh air. I've had days. Have you had days like that, Rebecca, where I... I'll get in my car and go, oh my gosh, I have not been in my car and pulled up the garage door and drove into the world yeah. for maybe yeah. three days at a time. Sometimes yeah. I can be in here doing this. It's just really yeah. strange. Does that happen for you? Well, I grew up in Florida, so I grew up my whole life outside and mm. I feel again, I think, um, you go, your brain goes back to places of nurture and, of uh, youth and safety. And so for me, I actually feel most calm outside. Yeah, um, so I'm always outside and I've made a point to get a house with a huge porch, front porch and back porch and side porch and make those spaces. I want to lit like live, like I'll get up in the morning at six in the morning. I'll go right out there and just grab my coffee, my journal, or the birds, man, this morning, the squirrels, the birds, they get caught in those gutters, man, and they just go to town and you're just listening to life. You're just listening. Yeah. But we all live a little bit, you know, on more green space now. And mm -hmm. I think it almost counterbalanced us being in New York um, because we are mm -hmm. trying to organically garden and have mm -hmm. bees as of last week, apparently. Whoa. <laughs> And then I do sourdough and we have chickens. And I think honestly, it's like, whatever you decide you're going to invest your energy in. I, I love the cultivation of working with my hands. And so it makes me be outside every day, all summer long. I'm outside pruning, harvesting, pulling yeah. weeds, whatever. And so sometimes if you make it a part of your lifestyle, you don't even really it's not like I need to get outside today. It's like, well, I have to get outside today. Um, yeah. and our garage is, is detached now, even intentionally. So it like forces us to walk outside to get in our car. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. So you wrote in your book, our latest book, everyone building a resilient life. You wrote this as a mother who in her twenties gave birth to a son with severe cognitive challenges in her thirties endured the sudden onset of panic in her 40s, lost a father after decades of mental struggle. I'm still learning what it means to bend under the weight of tumultuous seasons that feel accented by loss. And then you go on to say that your journey was, that the journey was a bedrock of hope. What surprised you most about that journey? Hmm. Well, every season, I, I turned 50 yesterday on mother's day. And I saw that. That's right. Happy birthday. Yeah. I meant well, to tell you thank that. You. It's more just to illustrate the point that every decade brings 
trial and jubilee. I mean, it just brings celebration and it brings um, deep grief and uh, longing. And I think every day does that. But even if you look back at each decade, there's going to be these turning points that you'll look back to and remember, oh, that that year, whoo, that was a doozy. And Mm -hmm. that diagnosis, that was really hard. But then this new life over here was, you know, just something I'll never forget. And so I think I would say, obviously, you know, mothering for all of us, we just had mother's Mm -hmm. day is, um, Mm -hmm. Ooh, that'll nothing humbles you more. Nothing makes you surrender more. And, you know, my onset of motherhood was, you know, a down syndrome diagnosis with my firstborn. And Mm -hmm. I was 20, I was 26. So I didn't know what I was doing at all. None of us know what we're doing Mm -hmm. mothering. Um, and so yet that created a sweet dependency and God got loud and, mm-hmm. and then, um, you know, panic disorder 10 years later, and then mm-hmm. God got loud again and adopting joy five years ago, um, you know, about 10 years after that, God got loud again. It's like, I think the Lord is always inviting us into risk and then asking, do you trust me? <laughs> and I kind of want to quantify it pre- prematurely like well if i say yes does this mean this and god never answers that he's such a rhetorical question asker it's like do you yeah. trust me and i'm like i guess i i i'm trying yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah and so that that piece i think has been the the greatest learner is that as he pushes us into new territories he will never leave us or forsake us and that to me I think it has kept me a little bit more of a, yes, Lord, you are the author and finisher of my faith. So if you're keep inviting me into scary, hard things, there's a little bit of excitement that's attached to it because Uh I also understand, like I said earlier, that the brain needs novelty to grow. And so if I am not doing a new thing, that's a little bit hard, that kind of gets my adrenaline going, then I'm not, I'm not building resilience there. And I, if I just get comfortable and safe, uh, my resilience will kind of die. And, um, I love that we are on a continuum with our resilience meter, right? Like we're Mm -hmm. somewhere between like crazy risk taking or super sedentary and, you know, apathetic. Well, we don't want to be on extremes, but we for sure want to be making sure that every day we're doing something moderate, uh, predictable and controlled with support that requires, uh, that activates our stress response. Like yes. we have to feel nervous. We need to feel a little nervous about hard things on a small scale, almost every day so that we can grow in our resilience. Why do, why does every word you say just like excite me from every cell of my being? <laughs> like, well, cause yes. you, you're such a fitness guru. I mean, like you uh, don't know what it means to not do something hard every day, whether <laughs> physically exerting yourself or reading mm-hmm. a book that's a little Mentally, too mm-hmm. above your grade Science, level you know? learning mm-hmm. that's me with seminary i'm like i don't understand Oof. half of what these words mean and now i feel challenged but i also feel uh expectant and i like i like to be a little bit outside of my comfort zone we have to be outside of our comfort zone or we're not going to grow And I'm, that's why I think at 50, I feel more young and expectant than I did even turning 25 because I didn't, I was still in Comfortville at 25. Cade was not born until 26 Mm. and Mm. Mm. life is just pretty planned out at 25 Man, 26. It was like, nope. And all of a sudden we're going rogue and everything's in it. We have no idea what's around the bend. And the sooner we get to that in life the more we are up for the journey and not the destination. What are you doing right now that's building resilience in you? Or I guess the question is, if it's connected to something that's difficult, what are you doing right now that's difficult and building resiliency? I would say for right now, the biggest one, like that's acute for me is seminary because I said yes to a cohort and we are all loving it, except it's way harder than I thought it would be. And, um, to the point of, you know, really pushing me, um, academically, um, and with papers or 
final exams. And, but yet at the same point, while I want to complain, I'm like, man, I am learning so much right now. Mm. Uh, the other piece I would say is, um, Gabe and I are writing a book together. Never done that before with a new editor. Never done that before on the topic of marriage. Never done that before. So I think <laughs> again, there's a lot of bending wow. and shifting yeah. and humbling <laughs> coming with that. Um, and then the, I would say the third piece personally is more that like I've launched kids mm-hmm. and they're home for the summer. They just got mm-hmm. home and I'm not good with transitions. Mm-hmm. Like I hate it when they leave. And then when they mm-hmm. first come back at home, I'm like, okay, here's the rules of the house that have been very calm while you've been gone. And now you're disrupting that. <laughs> so, oh, tell me. You know, mm-hmm. it's, I think that's all of it. It's just kind of like, how do I bend? And, you know, and that's what resilience means. Um, that second definition is like to, to resume the original um, position after a season of compression, like being squeezed mm-hmm. and bending low. And I think mm-hmm. motherhood does that our vocational work does that. Like it'll be almost a rhythmic cadence of like, this is a really heavy lifting season, whether it's mm-hmm. right or speaking in front of a, a larger audience than you ever have, or doing, you know, a marathon of, of talk, whatever it is. That's like the next thing that's pushing mm-hmm. you. You, you always start at like, Whoa, there's just no way I'm so nervous about it, but then you do it. People encourage you and you're like still standing. And you realize, yeah. okay, that's not quite as scary now that I push through. Uh, I was invited to that seminary cohort. <laughs> I have sweaty hands and palms and pits just thinking about the work you're doing. And I, I, I have this like dual, like, oh, I should have said yes. Look how far okay. along I'd be. And then I'm like, I'm so glad I didn't say yeah, yes girl. because you, Jess Conley, Jamie Nato, I'm like, oh, oh, God. Yeah, girl. I pray for you all though. I'm like, they're thank doing you. It. I appreciate that. It. We, we truly at this point are mm-hmm. all doing it because we're all sticking with it. It's like, we're doing right. it as much for one another now. Mm-hmm as for the content, while it's wonderful, (laughs) you realize that's another rule of resilience. The fifth rule is endure together. Like you just actually can't build a resilient life alone and definitely can't endure something that's very difficult without your sisters. Uh, no matter what the topic is, whether it's motherhood, vocation, whatever. And, Mm -hmm. um, that is the solidarity. I think a lot of us are lacking, which it feels Mm -hmm. so lonely, Mm -hmm. but also the reason why God made us to be a communal people, because Mm -hmm. he's a communal God. And if you don't have that in your life right now, you're going to just have to be the one that initiates. I didn't initiate when I feel lonely. Cause I was like, well, if I'm feeling lonely, there's a strong chance somebody else is. So if I at least just cautiously go, Hey, do you want to get together? And start a Bible study or get coffee next week or do a girl's night out. I'll host. Like if you just say those words, you'll have four or five people say, yes, I promise you. So <laughs> true. Like, I thought you'd never ask. It's, it's, it's a breadcrumb. Like a it is, it does not take much. <laughs> I, so, so, so true. Oh yeah. man. Uh, you had a quote in, um, it was an IG that went around IG post a while ago and you were teaching somewhere and you said this, that an underactive body creates an overactive brain. And I went, yes, girl, and shared it all the places. And if that was another reason, I'm like, why has Rebecca Lyons not been on our show? And you, you hit on that a little bit with you know, the New York thing, but tell me more, tell me what that yeah. means to you. You know, I've read a lot of books like you, I'm sure on this content topic of mental health and the integration of embodiment. And I think it's fairly new to the church, which is kind of wild. Maybe not new to the church, new to the modern moment of church, because we almost segregate our spiritual life from our physical life. Yet Jesus never did that. Nothing in the first century was like that. Um, Mm. everything was on the move, you know, there Mm -hmm. was, there was an Uber and there was an Instagram, you know, Mm -hmm. everything was embodied. And so, um, I remember telling a friend a few years ago, I was like, I have a, I have a hard time sleeping at night. And this guy was a pro athlete and he goes, well, have you actually exhausted your body? (laughs) I'm like, no, I just sat about, sat on a chair all day thinking about how anxious I feel. (laughs) 
<laughs> like, so you haven't worn yourself out and you're wondering why you're not tired. <laughs> right. Hmm. Um, and yet in New York, I never had a problem with sleep. And that was a more stressful season in general. I mean, it was a little more like survival mode in certain ways. But at the same point, I was at least getting all that out of my body through the movement throughout each day. And so I would sleep hard every night in a city that never sleeps with lots of lights on. Yeah. But now I'm out in, you know, the woods and like all peaceful and Zen and like a wake up, wake, awake a lot. And so that's really where I just, I had always kind of been a runner or, you know, um, short distances and now walking lots of movement and I'll do rowing. I do different rhythmic things mm -hmm. just depending on my foot or my knee or whatever. But in general, I'm always making myself do it. And when I do, I'm always a lot more, uh, my brain is just a lot more calm. So that was how I realized, okay, so we're holding stress inside. Yep. We don't have an outlet for all the inputs that we got that day to go somewhere. And we're wondering why our body, our brain is just ruminating or having intrusive thoughts chronically on a loop. And, mm -hmm. um, so I do so much movement around even talking to God or prayer walks or not yes. only my body, I also use move my, like I get words out of my mouth, whether it's just confessing or telling God, like, here's I'll journal and sit, but less often than I walk and talk to Jesus, if that makes sense, yes. because it's, I feel like the Lord's kind of working things out, um, easy, even as I move and pray. And I just, I just think that he meets us in the movement always has when he says, follow me. That's not like something to write down in your journal. He know, you know, use your actual legs and follow him. Right. So. Right. He doesn't say study me, read about me, follow me, follow which is me. also then the next question, <laughs> where are we going? Yeah. Follow me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, could you, Do just you tell trust me? me. <laughs> how long? What am I going to need? Who's coming with us? Yeah. 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 I, when do I we get to that. stop? When, yeah. <laughs> when do we get a phone break? <laughs> just follow me. <laughs> uh, it's so true. Next time I'm in um, Franklin, Tennessee, I'm like going to grab a handful of you. We're going for a walk. Like, yes, we a are. Walk and all the talk yes, about those are. things. And yes, it's I, honestly one of the things I'd like to start doing, even I haven't figured out the logistics with it yet, is to do these interviews walking. Like, you're walking, I'm walking, we're talking. Jamie Ivy and I did a live last June when we did like she was doing walking challenges yeah. and I was doing a lot of walking and we did a live while we walked. It was really fun. I'm like, I could do this a lot more. Uh -huh. um, it's I just love it so much. And I will leave a lot of um voice memos with like girlfriends while I walk sometimes too. Just and because again, I'm thinking about them. Yes. The Lord brings them to mind and I'll just, you know send him a little word of encouragement, but yes. I'm always panting through it. So I'm like, no, I'm Rebecca, those are my favorite texts <laughs> to get. I say to my friends, why do I, this, this is my love language. When you yeah. text me and you're yeah. like, sorry, I'm out of breath, but I'm like, yeah. no, yeah. keep talking. Tell I know. Me. I'm like, I'm going up a hill that I really promise it's a hill. <laughs> oh, <it's> so good. <laughs> Okay. One more question for you. What are like the non-negotiables for you, Rebecca, for your resilient life right now yeah. in this, in this season? Non yeah. I would say like daily rhythms of movement for sure. And without a mm -hmm. fail, for sure. Outside, um, outside mm -hmm. walking. Um, mm -hmm. um, and then I would say real honest conversations with a real friend every day. Mm -hmm. um, it, it might even be my sister in Colorado on Marco Polo, but regardless, there's, so I'm telling the truth, uh, to someone I trust that's going to give them the full, fullest picture of me that, that I want, that I think is right. And that I want to share outside of Gabe. Right. Mm. Um, I just think that, that open vulnerability and raw honesty of like my struggle, of what God is showing me redemption. The humility of that is really important to keep me grounded. I think in this space, people can get a little caught up in it. And I don't, I don't, I'm not about that. Mm. I don't, I don't appreciate it when people do that. I don't, we're all just in process. Come on. Uh, some of yeah. us write and speak about the things we're learning, but man, the minute we start to separate ourselves as other 
Um, I'm just not about that. I, I, yeah. I can't stand it when I hear people talk like, well, you don't know what it's like to live public. I'm like, no, no, no. Mm. Everyone is walking a hard journey <laughs> mm-hmm. and um, none of us have arrived, praise God, um, because I think it keeps us humble and grounded. And so for me, I just, I want regular conversations with regular humans that yeah. are really honest, just about real life stuff. Um, so that we don't somehow buy into that celebrity weirdness. And I'm very passionate about that. (laughs) Yes, Uh, girl. And then also I would say clean food. Um, My kids always joke that we don't have a snack house. We have an ingredient house. And um, (laughs) they always act like we don't have food. I go, hey, but look at all the things you've learned to cook. (laughs) Look at you making your own little protein ball. And yeah. your overnight oats and you know, and this all started from Whole30 about five or six years ago, which the kids always joke about. But now they are such fitness like people and yeah. really care about it. And so they always like begrudgingly joke and tease me. But I'm like, but look at you. You're gonna do this yeah. when you grow up to your yeah. kids, and they're gonna be, where's the sugar cereal? And you'll be like, have an egg. <laughs> so so, um, so clean food movement and honest conversation with real people. And then finally, I would just say just ongoing dialogue with God. And you know that um, Mm. you're just like this, just, Mm. just talking to Jesus all the time, shower in bed, driving, um, you know, between conversations or meetings, just God, like, thank you for loving me and being there. Yeah. Okay. So to recap, moving outside on honest conversation with people, regular people, clean food, and dialogue with God. That's it. I'm moving to Franklin, Tennessee. Come on, I'm, girl. <laughs> I'm like, all my, all my people I, are moving to Franklin, Tennessee. I'm like, the portal is open in Franklin, Tennessee. <laughs> if you get anywhere near it, it's going to hey, suck. We will always make room for one more. Oh Trust me. Gosh, people are like, everyone's so moving here. I'm like, come on. God's doing something. I don't know why everyone's moving here. Not everyone is, is moving something. here. This sounds very, I don't mean to say that. God's doing <laughs> incredibly all over. There are just some people from different seasons of my life that all happen to be moving here. And it feels so sweet that those worlds are colliding, but God's doing a new thing everywhere. And Franklin is not special. Um, it's Mm. just a sweet thing when you find kindreds that all live in the same place. And I do. Well, you get out there and keep those regular, honest conversations going, keep people moving, keep writing the books. Um, man, it's like you're the coming up on a Ruth Haley Barton right <laughs> in her tracks. Just, just hand it on to the next generation, the Come same on. message, wholeness, and body God life. So kind. Nothing is, nothing's new to God, but he does That's find right. different voices to find different ways to express those things. And I'm just so thankful for a tribe of sisters that all are passionate about Jesus and passionate about health and passionate about our bodies being a temple that we want to steward and it's a gift to know you and know the work that you do and cheer Mm. you on and thank Mm. you for um the peace that you carry when you enter a room is so evident and Mm. that that's at one point was probably hard fought but now it's just something you demonstrate Mm. uh, just through abiding. And so I just want to honor that in you and thank you for, for who you are to this community. Well, we're grateful you're here. And now I'm going to boss you around for a little bit to get you past the 10 K. <laughs> sure sure you will. And I welcome that. I just, yeah, have my number <laughs> ever so lovingly and kindly in Jesus name. Yes, All right, yes. everyone. The book is building a resilient life. Um, Rebecca Lyons at Rebecca Lyons on Instagram and all the places um, you do will not go wrong with buying any of those books that you are free, right? It was, you are free. That was oh, the, there yeah, was one that you free. wrote. The very first one was free fall to fly. And then you are free. Free that fall to was, fly was more the physical healing. You are free was the heart healing that followed. Yeah. That yeah. one I purchased for my daughter and anxiety, your story of just kind of overcoming that was, was radical. Put you on the radar of my life. And now I'm just so grateful yeah. to get to now know you friend. and I walk it. alongside you in all the ways. Thanks Thank for being you. here so much. We appreciate you. Be blessed. Same. All right. Bye friend. 
Thanks for watching and remember this video was brought to you by Revelation Wellness Instructor Training Program. Do you love Jesus and have a passion for fitness and wellness? Or maybe you're tired of the roller coaster of obsessing over and neglecting your body and you know there has to be more to fitness. Let us equip you to lead others to health and wholeness rooted in Jesus Christ through our faith-based fitness instructor training program. Go to our website to learn more and listen to testimonies of people just like you who are bringing hope and healing to their communities as fitness teacher gospel preachers. Click the link in the description of this video and download a packet to get your journey to health and wholeness through Christ started today.